The year was 1925. The Roaring Twenties were seeing great economic growth and cultural prosperity among Americans. At the same time in the world of science, the recognition of Darwin's theory of evolution was growing. Along with the growth of recognition came an increase in opposition. A notable adversary to Darwinism, Williams Jennings Bryan, led a fundamentalist movement against Darwin's theory of evolution. With speeches given such as the menace of Darwinism and the Bible and its enemies, Bryan most certainly advocated what he believed in. Laws would later be put in place preventing the teaching of Darwin's theory of evolution. John Scopes, a teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, was accused of breaking those laws and was soon prosecuted, leading to the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Join us as we explore the state of Tennessee versus John Scopes and how this debate would change the world of education forever. <laughs> William Jennings Bryan was already very well known previous to his involvement in the Scopes trial. Bryan was a three-time presidential candidate and he led large movements against Darwinism. Theodore Roosevelt once said that he would make the greatest Baptist preacher on earth. Bryan would go on to lead the prosecution of John Scopes in the trial as the perfect adversary to Darwin's theory of evolution. The American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, was an organization founded in 1920 with the intent of defending the constitutional rights of American citizens. The ACLU does this by instigating and intervening in legal cases where the violation of due process, equality, or freedom of expression are present. The Butler Act, introduced by John Washington Butler in 1925, was a Tennessee law prohibiting school teachers from contradicting the biblical account of mankind's origin. The law troubled the ACLU greatly. As an instantaneous response to the Butler Act, the ACLU made it clear that they would defend any teacher accused of violating it. The ACLU provided celebrated lawyers Clarence Darrow and Arthur Hayes and would convince someone to act as the defendant to challenge the law, John Thomas Scopes. Well, Scopes was a 24-year-old part-time uh, football coach, math, general science, and biology teacher at Rio County High School in Dayton, Tennessee. John Scopes taught a portion uh, in a textbook about theory of evolution to his students, which violated the Butler Act. On May 5th, Scopes would agree with the ACLU to stand as the defendant to challenge the law. Now, let's take a deep dive into the debate and see what actually happened. After Scopes agreed to participate in the trial, he was placed under arrest but was immediately bailed out for $500. Brian agreed to participate in the trial on the side of the prosecution. Several days later, the well-known attorney, Clarence Darrow, took the side of the defense. Starting on July 10th, the two sides argued for eight days. With the Butler Act constantly being used against the defense, the first big move Darrow had to make was to attack the law. On July 13, Darrow began to give a fiery speech arguing that the Butler Law violates the First Amendment and the freedom of religion in an effort to declare the Butler Act unconstitutional. With Brian being cornered, he began to ridicule the scientific principles of the theory of evolution. The next day, Darrow objected to the practice of opening the trial with a prayer, since they were arguing around religion. The judge immediately overruled his objection. This illustrates the general bias towards the prosecutors throughout the trial. After the defense tried to declare the Butler Act unconstitutional for two days, on July 15th, Judge Ralston overruled their motion, making their efforts a waste of time and putting them at a huge disadvantage. Later that day, a plea on Scopes' behalf was placed. The prosecution showed evidence of Scopes' teaching evolution with the witness. With the help of a zoologist, the defense argued that evolution should be taught as it is a widespread idea. The prosecutors later objected to the use of scientists and experts in the court on the defense's behalf, and the judge ruled in favor. With the defense against the wall, Darrow insisted that Brian should take the witness stand as an expert, and as Brian fell into the trap, he was asked scientific questions he couldn't answer, like, when was the earth created? In this image, Clarence Darrow is shown standing up while interrogating William Jennings Bryan, who is sitting in front of him. The physical stances the men are taking represents Brian's poor situation in the current part of the debate. The judge immediately tried to stop the heated argument between the two, but Brian refused to step off the witness stand and attempt to make his case. Eventually, the judge had to remind them that they were there to establish whether John Scopes did or did not violate the Butler Act. However, this was after Brian was logically defeated in the portion of the debate. On July 21st, 1925, the jury declared John Scopes guilty in a mere 9 minutes and he was charged with a fine of $100. During the trial, the intense debates fostered a severe mental toll upon Brian. 
On top of that, he's been diagnosed with diabetes and other health problems. As a result, William Jennings Bryan died in his sleep six days later. Bryan's death impacted America greatly. Before the case, he was known as one of the greatest preachers in the whole world. However, with the huge defeat in court after taking the witness stand, his legacy fell into pieces, and the press reported he died of a broken heart. The judge overruling all of the defense's motions and his favoritism towards the prosecutors clearly shows the religious dominance over scientific thought at the time. Many years after the verdict, the scope trial continued to have lasting effects in form of other debates and bills because of lasting controversies. In 1968, the U.S. Supreme Court case of Epperson v. Arkansas emerged over an Arkansas law forbidding the teaching of human evolution in public schools. Later in 1997, the case of Freyla v. Tangipahoa Parish Board of Education occurred over a mandatory disclaimer that teachers in Louisiana had to mention before teaching evolution. Recently in 2012, the Tennessee Academic Freedom Bill was put into place to respect and defend teachers who permit students to contradict rudimentary academic beliefs such as the theory of evolution and even climate change. We can investigate the changes in the United States school system to develop an understanding of how modern day life was affected by the Scopes trial nearly 100 years before. A large portion of the way biology has been taught over time has been through the use of textbooks. By taking a look at textbooks before and after the Scopes trial, we can identify some key differences that were undoubtedly a result. Preceding the trial, you can find a variety of stances on evolution in biology textbooks. Although a few textbooks published in the early 1900s didn't touch on evolution at all, such as Peabody and Hunt's Elementary Biology and Hunter's Elements of Biology, most textbooks did include evolution, with some devoting entire chapters to it. In fact, Williams Bryan himself once complained about seeing too many monkeys in textbooks, further proving this idea of diversity before the Scopes trial. Right after the Scopes trial and the conviction of the defendant, however, the prominence of evolution in textbooks and in the classroom plummeted. Textbook publishers would go on to remove everything about the theory of evolution being the primary subject of life. In one case, a Texas governor even demanded the state textbook board to literally cut out the pages mentioning evolution with actual scissors. The absence of evolution in textbooks would go on for quite some time, but would start to slowly reappear in the 1940s and 50s, with a few authors and biologists claiming that the theory of evolution was already proven. We had teachers that I used to work with that were so religious, they refused to even talk about anything that dealt with evolution. And a lot of the school districts didn't even have uh, chapters in the books on evolution. You know, it was kind of a hot topic and a lot of students even uh, did not want to talk about evolution. In the late 1950s, the Soviet Sputnik 1 was launched as the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. Many officials in the United States became distressed at the thought of the Soviet Union having an intellectual advantage over them. This then led President Dwight D. Eisenhower and Congress to pass the National Defense Education Act of 1958 which favored the National Science Foundation to produce new and advanced science textbooks for the next generation of students. Major controversy over what to include in these new textbooks ensued, with amendments being proposed to not include evolution in these new textbooks. Eventually, the National Science Foundation established the Biological Science Curriculum Study, or BSCS, and appointed them to produce new textbooks. Over time, the textbooks produced by the BSCS faced controversy, but still became the new textbook standard and were said to put evolution back in the biology classroom. In United States classrooms today, evolution is taught almost everywhere. In Virginia today, evolution is required to be taught at public schools. Although evolution can be found in the biology textbooks they use today, that isn't to say that there isn't still controversy with the Scopes trial presumably at its origin. For example, certain political party platforms in some states still oppose the teaching of evolution in the classroom. Some education officials in the state of Kentucky plainly tell their teachers that they should teach other, more religious principles in the classroom. What's more surprising, the state of Alabama to this day requires that textbook manufacturers provide a disclaimer in their books regarding evolution and to note that it is only a theory. According to a study published in 2007, 13% of biology teachers in the United States highlighted that creationism was a valid and scientifically accurate substitute to evolution, with only 33% of biology teachers presenting evolution in a totally accurate way according to today's modern scientific standards. Using all this information, we can recognize how the Scopes trial had lasting impacts that affect us even today, almost a hundred years later. The overall acceptance of America and its classrooms on evolution, along with the continuity of controversy over the topic, allows us to understand that the Scopes trial was an essential part of the recognition of science and Darwinism.